I'm Tanya Balut Hussein, and that's me. <laughs> I'm Wazar, bassist in Wazda. Um, and so you guys are both in Wazdu. Can you actually tell me a little bit just about your band? Mm -hmm. just, just a basic like, blurb if you want to give me a blurb about Wazdu. So Wazdu started as a, Wazdu actually, first of all, it means make, to make noise or to speak up in Hindi and Urdu. They're actually the same language <laughs> with different scripts. So Urdu? Yes, Urdu is the national language of Pakistan, oh. and Hindi is the national language of India. And because of the country's strange and peculiar history, um, when the countries got split up, the languages did too. Am, and I, am I dumb for not knowing that? They, they yeah. Literally the same <laughs> <language>? <laughs> I really no, didn't no, know you, that. Well, no, this is why we're doing this project, right? Is like to yeah. learn more about... It's, and it, and I, I wanted to specifically use uh, that language, even though I don't speak that language, but the, like the, my family's life and everyone in the band in some way has been affected by like socio-political weird historical stuff that happened this century. And so one of the things about it, you know, India and Pakistan got split in half in 1947, used to all be part of British India, colonization, colonial uh, Britain. And then, yeah, languages splintered, fights broke out over culture, like really stuff that like through generations people are still reeling from it. Like even my generation, like we still feel those those um, cracks in language and culture and our family stories and stuff. So anyway, so so I founded the band as a way to like bring South Asian people together to like talk about our histories and talk about our politics and stuff. And I wanted it to be a name that was hard to pronounce, you know, because hard to pronounce, you know. Um, in, in Boston, you know, there weren't any bands that, that I knew of that had um, names in Hindi or Urdu that were like just kind of American rock bands. And so, yeah, so anyway, so I made this, I created this band, I was auditioning different kinds of names. And I think you and I had just started dating when I was forming Waz, though. Mm -hmm. And like, I asked him, you know, what do you think? Like, here's some ideas. And you were like, Waz, though, yeah, definitely Waz, though. That sounds cool. And some of the other ones just felt too, I don't know, like I was trying too hard or something. <laughs> That's what I don't know. What do you think? I was, that was really perfect. You were definitely yeah. a magnet. And oh, here's the other thing. In Throughout South Asia, like on the back of trucks, you know, these really beautiful, colorful trucks in South Asia, like these big lorries to come. And then often they have these phrases in the back, like honk your horn, horn please, or awazdo, which means make some noise. And so awazdo has a double meaning. It literally means to make you know, like honk your horn because I can't see you. Um, but it also means to speak up or to use your voice politically and socially. So that's where the band name came from. Because, yeah, part of the project, too, is to, like, it evolved very much into wanting to, to speak up about things we felt like there wasn't cultural space to talk about you know, yet. <laughs> so, yeah, that's so we got together. Actually, that's, that's not a blurb at all. That's the whole story. But I, I wanted to create a band to, like, make art and use tropes and, and about South Asia and South Asian culture. And it started out as a Bollywood band for, like, one night project. You know, I had a friend who booked me for a show. And was like, oh, can you just put together? I didn't even have a band. I was oh a solo performer. I go by Saraswati Jones, which is like my solo stage mate. And I was like, I have to put together a band, and I want to do some Bollywood covers. And I always thought that Bollywood songs, Bollywood is like the Indian um, film industry, you know, and the popular film industry. Um, and I always wanted to like do punk covers of. There's certain Bollywood songs I'm like, this is. A, perfect three chord punk song like how has no one done and I used to like scroll YouTube looking for some punk I'm like no one's done Kuch Pachota hey like I was waiting and then one of my friends I think was like why don't you just do it you know why are you waiting you know I was like I can barely play guitar you know and then I realized like oh yeah like the Ramones could play their instruments you know it's just like that is punk rock is is DIY so anyway yeah it started out as something that was really simple but when I saw a bunch of like they, they see me like South Asian it's kind of our colloquial way of saying South Asian when I saw this, like, Daisy people come out to a rock club and come into a space for that show that, like, they would never normally be there, I'm like, wow, it's really powerful for them to see people that look like them on stage. And people rushed us afterward, and they're like, what's the next show? I was like, what do you mean next show? This is, like, just a one-time thing. So and even your first show, it was already kind of, you already had the punk rock influence into the whole, like, Bollywood sound, right, or whatever that is. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking, because I... 
it was definitely punk rock, like loud, distorted guitar, like very much like we don't know if this is gonna work or not, but it was more about the emotional expression, you know. <laughs> so in that sense, it was very punk, you know. Um, we didn't have the dole back then; it was just like straight up rock instrumentation. It was like drums, bass, guitar, you know, two guitars. Wait, were you already in the band at the time? No, there was a, another bassist. I oh, okay. I joined maybe like halfway through the band's sort of uh, trajectory today. Okay. So then, so the original band you just kind of put together around whatever you were able to find. Was it like yeah. friends, or did you already have like some uh, people that you were playing music with that happened to be from some of the backgrounds? Yeah, you know, it, there were people who I had connected with through either open mics or I was a fan of theirs. Um, through the Boston rock scene or through the um, Asian American open mic night called East Meets, War East Meets Words. Um, and so what would happen is like my years in the Boston like art scene, I would kind of slowly like be looking for other South Asian people. And then when I had my own band, I started pilfering people from other bands. I was like, so let me talk to you about this project. And so I assembled this group of people and when they heard the idea, they were like, yes. I don't think anyone said no. I was so excited and I couldn't, I didn't know how to lead a band and I, you know, but yeah, there were people who I kind of, I would say they were acquaintance and acquaintances and who I admired a lot. And I talked them into my band somehow and I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and I barely, you know, I, I was really new at songwriting and everybody was so awesome and supportive. And, and actually our founding drummer who, um, Leilani Roser, she's, um, ha her, she has Filipina heritage. And um, she, even though she's not South Asian, she knew, was familiar with Bollywood and did all the, a lot of the original arrangements of the songs and stuff. So, cause she was just like, and she's a DIY punker too. Like she just taught herself and she's just amazingly talented. So, and I continue to work with her to this day. But yeah, our original drummer, um, Leilani was, I just saw her playing around Boston. I'm like, who is this rad woman? Why do not, why am I not connected with this person? You know? And then Jag, uh, I saw him shredding in a band one night and I was like, who is this? Who oh, is this guy? I love him. You know, and he's just like, after he like, destroys the room with this amazing set, and then he sits at the bar quietly and drinks like three whiskeys. And I was like, like, well done, sir. Who are you? you know? And then years later, I, I'm like, be in my band. I was too amazed by his guitar to actually pay attention. Is he Sikh or what's his background? He's Sikh, yeah. Okay, he's Sikh. Okay, I wasn't sure what the, the headwear was, but I was like, I just, every time I'm watching, I'm just like, oh my god, he's shredding again. And I'm just like looking at the guitar and like, um, <laughs> uh, okay, cool, yeah. No, no, that's okay. I, you know, one of the things I love about, I wanted to specifically have a band of people of color. Like it wasn't, at first my, my dream was like, I want to have a bunch of like South Asian people who identify as women. So I was like, it'll be awesome to have a little auntie band, you know, because I thought it would be cool because you see Indian aunties and nobody expects them to like pick up a guitar and shred, you know. But I couldn't find, I mean, there was so, and I asked around like my, um, South Asian women friends in Boston, and like 20 people were like, yes, but I don't know how to play an instrument. And so I was like, oh, well, I don't know if I can teach people, so let me start with people who already play. And then, but what I what was important to me was to have a band that was all people of color and as many South Asian and Asian American people as possible because I wanted to make a statement without saying anything. <laughs> you know, just us being on some of those stages in some of those rooms we play, people are like, I mean, they will remember us, you know, <laughs> so, and it's been really great, people have been really welcome, but I, I think it was an interesting mirror to the Boston rock scene, to, to like, to see that it was, you know, that it's, it's a diverse city, but it's really deeply segregated, artistically, you know, physically, and, yeah, it was just an interesting way to, to make that statement, and pe but people were very receptive, to it. it's a thoughtful town, you know. Yeah, for that lineup to exist on a stage in in you know a rock club in Boston was just a statement in and of itself. Were you at the time? Did you? I'm assuming you were at the first show. I was at the first show. Yeah. Okay. Were you already in your video. own band too at the time? No, I actually stopped playing music for a long time. Uh oh. Yeah. I picked it up again when Mono, the original bassist, kind of you know he retired to work on some other things. So. All right. So yeah. I started playing again. And he left some big shoes to fill, so you know, did my best to fill them. <laughs> Great. And every person that's joined the band has added their own influence. Mana was deep in hip hop and spoken word, so his, he had very melodic bass playing, beautiful improvisational grooves. And Azar is like a DC punk, so he's just like, da -da 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 -da, you know, really awesome, really powerful driving bass lines. And Leilani had a, has a punk DIY ethic, but she loves also like complex rhythms. And our drummer now, she is very, very mathematical. And so she's, she's great at like 
you know, stylistically understanding and nailing a very specific thing. So, I mean, everybody's brought a different flavor to the band. So just, it's, we, I when I say punk, I'm thinking about an ethos, like just an approach to the music too. Cause I mean, I personally love, we both personally love punk rock, like as it's defined, I mean, it's barely defined. It's hard to even define, that's a whole other documentary. <laughs> but it's just, it's like very much about um, doing something that you're like implicitly told that you're not supposed to do and just teaching yourself how to do it. And I still consider myself a punk because I like, I'm teaching myself how to record and I'm teaching myself how to, you know, do production. And, but that's always been the spirit of Owasso. And you know what? I know so many great musicians in Boston that I think I could have had in the project. But I would 10, ten times out of 10 always take somebody who was like, I'm really excited about this and I want to learn and have them come and then learn through the process. Because it's, it's much more about the process than the product, you know, to me. So cool. <laughs> um, let's go back a little bit yes. then. Okay, so you've already said you stopped playing music for a while. What was your early? I guess how did you get into music? Um, I think like a lot of us, I just kind of started in high school. You know, I had some buddies. One of them was a drummer, and another played guitar. So I, I just picked up the bass by default. And uh, yeah, you know, it was it was high school. We kind of smoked pot. In, in our friend's basement. This was in DC? Uh, yeah, no other Brazilian DC, right? Yeah. And yeah, was it punk bands? Was that? Is it punk bands or kind of music? I, I'd say maybe like a funk or kind of like a jam band with, with a with a metal y kind of guitar thing. Yeah. What What's, uh, give me your like five influences from that time. All right. That's gonna be tough. <laughs> I'd say P Funk, Ron's band. Fishbone has been kind of an all time. Uh, actually, all of these have been kind of all time favorites. Soundgarden was a big one back then. Um, yeah, I guess I guess those those were the the main ones. You know, I'm kind of streaky. I, I think like I've gotten really into bands or really into certain types of music at different points in my life, and you know, just kind of do deep dives on particular bands or. or members side projects and stuff so like I love Fishbone, Living Color, Bad Brains. Um, still, we're literally seeing still. Fishbone next week. Yeah. Huntington <laughs> <laughs> Beach. Nice. I was always a big fan of Rollins and his works, you know, Black Flag, Rollins Band. Mm. Yeah, so I've, I've listened to all kinds of stuff and okay. enjoy all kinds of music. Like lately I listen to a lot of Doom as well. And then Wait, MF Doom, or are we talking about like Doom Metal or Doom? Yeah, Doom Metal. Doom Metal. Yeah. I was like, MF Doom is awesome. Yeah, cool. Um, but yeah, no, I, I loved a lot of rap and hip hop in general as well. You know, the first cassette I ever bought was. Uh, there were two I bought on the same day. There were singles, right? The singles. And it was Vanilla Ice, <laughs> Ice Sex Baby, and <laughs> MC Hammer's Prey. Yes! <laughs> No, I can I can relate to that. One of the first the first CDs I bought, one of those Big Willie style. Oh, yeah. Na, 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 <laughs> yeah. Na, na. Oh yeah, I was a huge Elizabeth fan. <laughs> Not even Fresh Prince, even though I didn't know about Fresh Prince before that. I was like, I like Big Willie style because that's classic hip hop music. Um, but yeah, I was always looking for you know people that look like me or were were bringing sort of a different experience to rock and roll. You know, there's there's a lot of bands that. Whose lyrical content is just just doesn't speak to that type of experience, right? Alienation because of culture or race or, or whatever your background is. So I was always kind of looking for that. Yeah, actually, you want to talk about your background real quick, just like sort of how you. Sure, I'm of Pakistani and Indian origin. I was born and raised in Dubai. Uh, I moved to the United States in the late '80s, and. Uh, I don't know, it was, it, was, it was quite an adjustment, you know. Dubai was very different back then. Uh, we lived in a mostly South Asian community. It was, you know, also very segregated. Right? So, like, the Emirati Arabs lived in their neighborhoods, and everybody else, you know, the, the, the migrant worker classes lived everywhere else. And, you know, so we were in a neighborhood, and, and I went to a school that you know, was made up of people that looked like me. 
coming to America, you know, coming to Ohio, because we're, we were landed at first. And, uh, there weren't a lot of South Asian people or you know, Asian or African American people there at all. So that was, that was quite a culture shock. And I think that experience kind of followed me through you know, the rest of my life, you know, or you can say informed to sort of how I see the world. So. Did you get into music as a kid too, or did that sort of not later? I always liked music. Um, I listened to it a lot in Dubai. Uh, we had a lot more, back then there was a lot more like British and European pop culture there. So like bands like Aha or Lamb was really huge. You know, Queen was really big. Paul Young, I think. Zimmer. But yeah, so I love stuff like Pop, hooky stuff with uh, you know big vocals. And then when you moved to the U.S., and you, how long did it take for you to sort of switch your taste to music? And... That's a good question. I don't know. Maybe within a year or so. It didn't take me too long to find Vanilla Ice. So. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't hard to find. And it wasn't a big jump between like you know I guess the music styling. I was a kid too, you know, I was kind of receptive and looking for, for new stuff, and, you know, I thought American culture was cool. Yeah. Nice. What about, what about you, your, your background? Oh, music has always been a part of my family life, and so I definitely get it from my family. Like, I grew up, my family's from Bengal, and Bengalis are known for, like, um, having music as a big part of our culture and like after dinner talent shows, like all that. So I, my earliest music was just like singing with my parents, you know, in our living room and it was, and, and hearing recordings of um, both like classical Indian music and folk music, but also my, my dad, my parents love American pop music. <laughs> and my dad actually went to college here in the sixties and he grew up in Texas. And so, I grew up listening to like country and like 60s rock and roll at home. And so that was a huge influence on me. I always loved it. And I always loved to sing. And my dad especially really encouraged me to sing karaoke. So like, like bought this high tech karaoke machine in the 90s. And it, we, we still have it, it's called Special K. Um, and yeah, so I sang karaoke with like my family, my friends, my dad, the Indian community in Grand Rapids, Michigan where I grew up. But so I've always, it's always been like a, a, a family and sort of like a, a social experience for me. And I grew up playing violin in school, in orchestra, and I was a bad student. I like never did my practice. I never practiced. I learned all the pieces by ear and I would go and pretend like my score would be upside down. and just like, you know, thinking about other things. But the good thing is that when you learn the violin, your, 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 your ear training is really good. So I could pick things up by ear later in life, like picking up guitar and stuff. It was it felt easier because I had that violin. Once you play the violin, you can like play and sing pretty much. Um, yeah. So I, I, but I love all kinds of music. I was very drawn to like heavy rock and roll in the, when I was a kid, though. And I honestly, I. I felt very weird because I didn't know any other like little brown girls that were listening to like Soundgarden or like you know Nirvana was just exploding at that time and I was just like am I alone am I weird why do I like this music am I broken somehow you know like I'm, am I full of angst that my classmates don't seem to feel where so, were you living at that time when you were getting into the music I lived in Grand Rapids Michigan in West Michigan and it's a con it's a conservative part of the country, but you know during those times like grunge rock was taking over. Rock was like the popular music, but, um, but then I re then I my world opened to hip hop. I listened to a lot of Wu Tang growing up, and you know boom bap was everywhere. So it was like those influences of grunge rock and hip hop really are in my mind, and also like classical Indian music and folk music. So so part of the band actually was like how can these things you know living in this mental space where you're like okay. This music is for this space, and this music is for that space. And I was like, how can I make them talk to each other? Because in my mind, I hear these things all at the same time, you know? So, so that's part of why our band sounds the way it does. Because, like, it's, it's a reflection of our very diverse influences, you know? And I know every band has diverse influences. But in this case, like, our influences literally exist, like, in different planes, you know, of, of music. And so... But anyway, yeah, music has always been, it's like in my DNA, and I'm, it wasn't until I was 30 that I started being able to 
play music, you know, and just like express myself through music, which was like a gift. You know? Didn't expect that. <laughs> Wait, so first bands. First bands. Yeah, first time you actually started playing music in like a band setting or a group setting. Mine was t 2010. I joined a band in Somerville, Mass. called the Michael J. Epstein Memorial Library. <laughs> and it was like 10 women and this guy named Professor Michael J. Epstein. And we would all dress like librarians with these cat eye glasses and pearls and like shush the audience and, and sing these like, like adorable but really dark songs about <laughs> the human condition, you know. It was really fun. That's the band I toured with. And I was like, what is this world? You know, and I was like a public health career track, like... Boston academic hospital type and that just blew my whole world open. I didn't even know I could be part of something like that. <laughs> it's really weird. I didn't expect it either, but I, I fell ass backward into it. Um, and I always, and that's why I like am encouraging people of all ages. I'm like, it is never too late to start. Believe me. It is never too late. And I, yeah, it's such a gift to just, even if you never go on tour, even if you never record, it is such a gift just to like play music, you know? And it seems really hard, I think, but I think most people have some innate musicality, you know. <laughs> and I'm always that, that auntie at the party who's like, come here, come here, giving everyone a tambourine, you know. Because <laughs> I just, I'm that kind of, I don't know. I think it's so deeply innate. I mean, this is, of course, my perspective because I grew up this way, but I feel like all of us want to express ourselves in some way. And the music is one of the first ways that we've done that as humans, and, you know. So... So yes, it's always been part of my life. I'm so happy to get the opportunity to do this. Like I'm still kind of overwhelmed by it. And before it. before you joined that group, yeah, you sang already. You were already singing, or was that no? No, no just kind of for fun. Okay. Um, karaoke, <laughs> like in, as a party trick almost. I had like right. a big acoustic guitar I would bring around and to parties. But that band was cool because the library band. They said. Anybody of any musical experience, whether it's zero or conservatory trained, is welcome. And I thought that was an interesting model. And they said, as long as you identify as a woman. And I was like, this is really cool, you know, and must be willing to wear costumes, which we did a lot, you know. Um, and I love that inclusivity. And through it, I met a lot of people who were like, conservatory trained violinists, never picked up an instrument before last May, you know. And I was, that, that opened my mind to, wow, okay. So music doesn't have to be just about proficiency and excellence and, you know, it can also be about expression and approaches and, you know. And you pretty much more or less started in a professional setting with the community, with the group. Like, yeah. That's, that's a really good way to go about it. Because trying to do it on your own and like figuring it out is actually oh. really, it's awkward. It's like really awkward. And it, it gives you all kinds of weird, um, not phobias, which is like, develop certain habits as yes. a solo person at the beginning. Right. So it's kind of cool to start out with, just like, oh, it's a community, we're in it. We're in it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, I mean, I, I definitely appreciate some people, it is completely and purely their own personal thing. But I agree, I think what a lot of people have this desire to like learn guitar or pick up drums or something, but they're, they learn, when you learn at home and by yourself, especially when you're an adult beginner, it can feel really discouraging, you know, because you don't have that motive or that, Something, there's some magic that doesn't happen. Every, and almost every like office setting I've ever been in, I started some kind of band, like almost by accident, you know, because I feel like people just need some kind of experience, you know, like that to, to cause I meet people who are like, oh, it's, I wish you could play guitar. I'm like, you can, you know, you really can. I'll show you three chords and then you can play like everything Bob Dylan has ever written in his entire life. Really? No respect, no disrespect about that. <laughs> Um, anyway. Well, let's jump back to the early bands and the sort of the getting into the music community. That's kind of more the question it was how did you get into the music yeah. community versus just like playing by yourself. So you had a band in, in D.C. or sorry, uh, Maryland. Yeah, so I had a band in high school. You know, we played a show or two here and there, but you know, it, it never really went too, too much further than that. Uh, I moved to Boston right after high school, tried to find people to kind of play with, but Unsuccessfully, you know, it was before before the days of like finding somebody on Craigslist or, or, or whatever else. So you would have to, you know, go out and put a piece of paper up in a coffee shop or something as, as I play bass and this, these are the bands I'm into. You know, here's my phone number. Is this so, so it's funny to even think about art? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> like now you can go onto something like this. This this is Facebook group I'm part of that. It's just so easy to find people. That, you know, I'm not telling you guys anything. Maybe. 
Um, but no, so I, I never really got into any too many bands during my time in Boston. I did tons of four tracking for a few years. You know, I had I had all my equipment and stuff with me, but over time that kind of like you know ran its course. I just kind of put the thing aside for a while. You were writing scores? Uh, no, just musical ideas, okay. songs. You know. yeah. Did you, so So then that was until you didn't pick up the instrument or didn't really play again until you joined this band? Yeah, pretty oh, much. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. How many years was that? Oh, man, a long time. <laughs> More than 10. Wow. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I, I, finally, I finally broke him down and talked him into maybe it was not really he was so happy to do it but like for years he'd seen all of our shows to that point almost and I was like you know the songs I know you can do it and he's like yeah sure you know and you knew yeah. he played music I mean I, I knew he played yeah music. and actually when we, we were first dating we just jammed together sometimes it was really fun you know and we'd just get ideas going and stuff and I was like oh yeah he's and we were on the same page musically we met because of music you know like I, so we our first date was like let's break down the Battle of Los Angeles by Rage Against the Machine and talk about it, you know, and I was like, this is love, you know, so I knew, you know, we had this, not just, like, interest in or, or, we had, like, a real passion about music and the role it played in both of our lives, which brought us together romantically, but then later, also artistically, so we got, we get married, in fact, Awazdo played at the wedding, (laughs) I'm, like, the bride, and Azar wasn't in the band yet, so he was, like, you know, celebrating the audience, you know, but, I mean, a lot. My mom was like, "Why isn't he up there? He should be in the band." You know, I was like, "You're right." You know, but we had a basis at the time. But anyway, I was yeah. a videographer for a long time. You were a videographer. Like, I got video for a show, and you know, <laughs> a bunch, bunch of them since. Yeah, um, that's true. So I, I, you know, I helped out as best I could. But oh, you, you know, I, I had kind of stopped thinking that I was going to be in a band and that I was going to play music. Just, just kind of stopped. I'm like a really good cheerleader. When people are like, I can't do it. I'm like, yes, you can. Yay. <laughs> I think it's the girl. I'm, I'm big in the girls rock camp thing. You know, like that's, I've been involved in that movement for a decade. So I kind of bring girls rock camp ethos to my life. And I kind of cheerlead everybody into things that they're like a little bit afraid of doing or not sure if they can do. But Oh, man. Well, now it's like you have to be a savvy market, like business person, and oh, marketer, because yeah. the record industry doesn't exist. Yeah. But yeah, it's hard. I know a lot of talented musicians in Boston too that I'm like, they would, it, it takes so much to even just run, have a band and then, you know, manage the logistics of that and then record and then put yourself out there. If, by the time you get to like phase six, it's just like a war of attrition. <laughs> it's like, who has the stamina to do this? You know? Yeah. And with little payoff that, you know, it's like, I mean, there's a great artistic, creative, emotional payoff, I think, but. Well, so let me ask, because yeah. being both people of color and people of, like, you know, South Asian, I don't know if y'all have the Asian parent, um... Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah we wrote a song yeah. about it. What, what, what was it like to tell them, like, hey, I like music and I want to play music? Or did you ever tell them? We we told them. And, you know, but I think part of it had to do with our point in life. I'm so, t- tell me your perspective, actually. I want to hear what, what, okay. how, what you think about how our parents have received our music. My parents were really against it. What? The idea. You play in Owasso? Oh, Owasso, they didn't care. About when it. you were a kid. Like, I was an adult by that time. Okay. But when I was a kid, you know, I had long hair. I wasn't really interested in school or whatever, you know. So the idea that, that I was, you know, not going to go to college, that I played the bass, that, you know, I was doing these other things. That, uh, they really weren't into the idea of it. So... I think making a living as an artist was something seen as like really frivolous, something that was, you know, for white people. Even if you were a trained pianist or violinist, you didn't have a chance. There was no point. You're supposed to go get your degree, go get a job, and then you can try all this other goofy stuff, right? Right. So, but yeah, so so they were really against it. I think now, like you know, whatever, I'm an adult. And, I, I think they kind of are surprised that, that we're out there doing the thing, you know. <laughs> but, I don't know, is that... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th- I was thinking now. I mean, now they celebrate it, and they're, like, happy for us. But, 
Yeah, when, he, when I was a kid, my parents were very happy about music and arts and creativity as long as it was like an extracurricular kind of thing. And we pursued our, you know, doctorate in, in the topic of our choice, um, as long as it was STEM sciences, you know. But yeah, I'm, I'm the only member of my generation that didn't go into dentistry or medicine. <laughs> so, and they're always like, we always knew you were kind of weird, but... But so my parents were a little more, but that's why I didn't do it till I was 30. I just didn't, it didn't even occur to me to like, I'm like, wait, this is a thing that you can actually do. You know, I don't understand. So I, but I loved seeing these bands and for years, literally until I was 30, I would go and see bands and long to be like, I'm like, oh, I'd love, I'd love to see more women on stage. I'd love to see more women of color on the stage, but I would never think I would like to be that person on stage, you know? And it's just because I just, it didn't even, it didn't occur to me. It took someone else to say, you just need to do it. Go ahead and do it. You don't need permission, you know. And, but I, you know what's awesome is that that has really changed. And I think in our, I feel like in our, in many of our South Asian communities, especially of a particular class, you know, structure where it's like all about propriety and income and um, that's changed, you know, I, there's more and more, especially for South Asians, we take up a lot of cultural space, way more than our percentage of the population should allow from a statistical point of view, but we are writers and painters and filmmakers. I mean, that just wasn't the case when we were growing up in like the nineties, you know, you, you know, there was like three or four musicians and that dude from No Doubt, you know, <laughs> and also quietly the guy from Soundgarden, right? Yeah, very quietly. Yeah, very quietly. Oh, even more quietly, like even like Eddie Van Halen, and then even more quietly, like there's all these guys that are like you don't even know they're actually Asian. Like Eddie yeah. Van Halen. Yeah. What? He's he's, yeah, he's like I want to say a quarter Japanese. Wow. Or something. It's it's trippy, and there's like yeah, actually yeah. doing my research for this project. I was just like, what? <laughs> okay. It's kind of like nobody really talks about Slash being like black. Yeah. Um, or having, you know, that it's just like nobody wants to talk about Eddie Van Halen being possibly partially Asian. I feel like there's a Vox.com article in this here. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, I it never, really is. Maybe, maybe it already is one. But it's just, you know, and that was part of why I'm asking about yeah. it and tying it to the idea of bands being a community. It's yeah. kind of like, yeah, most of us didn't have that. Every other kid can have a garage band when they're like 12 or 13 and their parents support them. But mm -hmm. as Asian kids, like, no, you learn your violin or your piano exactly. you go to your recital and you're supposed to hate it because yeah. it's a job you're oh. supposed to do it so like to have a community as a kid to, to even be able to play music i feel like that's difficult and then so like when you found your community yeah. and even you have a community but your parents are probably still not like nah, you're not gonna do this right yeah, right but like to, what what is it like to actually now have a community like oh you actually God. do have it. it is so it's powerful and what's what's interesting I think has been really cool and special and unique is that in Boston there is a very there's this burgeoning underground kind of South Asian American art scene happening around this open mic that started called Subdrift Subcontinental Drift you know it's actually a national kind of thing but we had this like I was part of that original organizing committee and it was like it used to be 12 of us in a room reading poetry or like somebody would tell a few jokes or somebody would play their ukulele and now it's like packed every month you know 100, 150, 200 people are in there. Poetry, hip hop, you know, people doing dance, sometimes classical music, sometimes, you know, it just, it's so inspiring. And what's been really fun is it was though, for one of our album release show, before we played Newport Folk Festival, we got to come home and play Sundrift. And looking around the room and seeing all these brown kids with tattoos and punk shirts, and I'm just like, who are, who are these kids? This is so awesome, you know? And we're like, on average, 10 to 15 years older than most people there. But what's cool, I'm like, yes, this, it's iterating, right? The whole, like, you must be a doctor engineer thing has changed, and we watched that happen. And, you know, what What has been really, like, wonderful is, like, our friends that have been organizing Subdrift and other people in our community, like, you were part of that, though. You were the aunties and uncles that showed us, and I was like, am I really... I'm not that, not that old, okay. No, but it's true. They're like, you're like our punk aunties and uncles. And I'm like, that's so cool, and that is literally why I wanted to do it. You know, I, I have a big personality, so I think... I wonder if a lot of people think I wanted to be a performer always, but I didn't. I really was terrified, and I'm still terrified because, but I do it because I'm like, I know if there's like one person I can reach that's like, hey, if she can do it, I can, you know? And I'm like, yes, that's success to me, is like showing other people that they can, that they don't need permission, you know? Um, and that they don't have to wait till they're like established professionals with a full time job to then suddenly express themselves. So. Because you really can. I would say like most people who say that there's definitely a few that's you know 
come to find a career after they've already had other career, like music career after they had a regular career. But I will say yeah. most people that I know, they stop playing. Like they just stop. Yeah. And I would be like, hey, you were so good at this thing. I wish. Some of these people are the ones that I'm like, hey, you should still quit your job and come back and play music <laughs> with me. Um, but most of them, yeah, like it's family, it's other stuff. As soon as yeah. you have a kid, and they still want to play. They still want to play music, but they just can't. Right. You can't get away from that. They've been through like 50. And then actually on Craigslist, you get like 50 year olds. They're yeah. like, hey, I'm 50, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. Can yeah. we get back together and play some music? But yeah. at that point, you can't tour anymore. You're like, it's. It's, it's hard. Yeah, so thank you for setting setting for examples to get some kids out there to do it earlier because <laughs> they're not going to all have the chance to do it later. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, but so then the question is, what do you do in real life, whether before you start the, started the man or currently, how do you mm-hmm. how do you sustain life? Yeah, good question. What's your day job? Well, you need one, first of all. <laughs> um, I Right now I work part-time. I've always been an administrative professional, so like executive assistant, chief of staff type roles where I'm working with high-powered executives. But now, right now, here in the Phoenix area, I work at a private school part-time, and then I write music on part-time. So, yeah. You did a lot with the Fulbright and all that stuff, too. That's true. That feels like forever ago now, but I was on, I was really on an academic research kind of track and I was a Fulbright scholar 15 years ago and I was looking at doing work on gender and health and actually I still do in my kind of more of my organizing work like my um, activism is kind of still geared around um, public health and empowerment and gender and reproductive justice and all these other things but I what I've learned is that having a paid job in that field to me is was never satisfying i was like okay cool i'm feel like i'm just part of this giant system that's going to keep the status quo if that and so what i find is that i feel like my energy is so much better put toward pushing pushing the envelope and pushing the voices that are marginalized toward the center but i don't think that nonprofit, you know or like working at harvard the harvard school of public health which i was doing in my previous job is the way to do that necessarily for me um i think my gifts are my talents are more with um working with activists you know and teaching each other and quietly changing the model (laughs) underground you know but thank you darling yeah but i'm sure i'm a secretary i have these wonderful secretary glasses in my day jobs i've always felt like i'm playing a role i'm always like i'm gonna pretend i'm a secretary but i've been pretending for many years you know. So I say you have a good Clark Kent thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The best compliment I ever got is someone said, wow, because I, I, I always wear these glasses when I'm at work, and I have this persona, this work persona that's very serious, so a lot of people were shocked to learn I was a musician and stuff. Um, and then I perform without my glasses, and so, so this Boston-based artist was like, you have a real Clark Kent Superman thing going on. I was like, thank you. That's so sweet. Anyway, so that's what I do. <laughs> For me, professionally, I did a bunch of stuff. Uh, when I lived in Boston, I made ice cream for a long time. I was, you know, local chain. That was kind of the thing I, I fell into for, for a long time. Uh, I was working on starting a company as well, you know, going out west and, you know, starting like a organic, small batch, locally sourced, all that stuff, ice cream, ice cream company. And it was, that was around 2001, and then, you know, there was the first dot-com bubble burst and, you know, September 11th, and, you know, that was kind of the end of a lot of that stuff. Uh, then I started going to college eventually as an adult, and I got into uh, laboratory sample management as, as kind of my, my day job. So basically anything that, you know, laboratory samples that need to be held in, you know, you know frozen. That's, that's kind of what I do. So right now, so I, I've, I've worked in a few different places. I worked for the Museum of Natural History in DC for a while, Research Hospital in Boston, a bunch of pharma companies. And uh, now I'm at the university here. I, I'm part of a group that stores uh, environmental samples for a long-term ecological monitoring uh, study. It's pretty cool, it's a 30-year project. and. Basically, what they're doing is, is collecting sample materials from 81 field sites across the continent. And we're the primary repository for all the stuff, all the physical samples that are collected. And, and the, the main 
the idea of it is to is to sort of attempt to characterize and quantify the effects of climate change over time. So, are there less beetles at this site from years one to seven than, than there were previously? That kind of thing. That's that's awesome. It's pretty wild, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I never expected to have like a sciencey job. I said. Yeah. Well, I was actually just gonna say like how after after the whole like oh people <laughs> punk rock or whatever, and then you're like a scholar and you have like medical field science jobs. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, so you guys are still very much, you know, I don't, I don't in know. the correct field of your lives. It's so embarrassing. Despite I don't know, it's our like, best despite efforts. Despite our best efforts, <laughs> really? like, oh my god, are, are we gonna like are the punks gonna make fun of us because we have like these scientific. I, I but I think that's actually not that this is meant for the parents, but um. It's like the parents should be able to hear this and be like, you can't. You can do all, all the things that you expect a successful Asian kid to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they should also really follow through on their music. Games. You know, I feel like when I was, when I was a kid, I, you know, it's easy to see your parents as tyrannical and they want you to go down and force you down this path, like, because they're just tyrants. But what I realize and appreciate now is that I'm an adult, even though I don't have kids, we don't have kids. But I see that that was the only path that they knew and understood. And, like, they were probably scared. You know, I get it. You know, you meet, like, young immigrant families now, and I'm like, oh, my God, how are they navigating all of this? All of this. And, and my parents were just like, okay, we understand school. We understand college. We understand corporate job. We understand, you know. But they don't understand Fulbright Scholar. They, don't, they didn't understand what that meant. They didn't, didn't know what it meant to do an artist residency. And so, so I get that. I see. I, I have a lot of compassion now. You know that they just wanted us to like have a better life than they had, and I get that. But I, what, what's cool though is I feel like our parents have come around though, and they're like, okay, you know, Tanya and Azar have their own path. You know, <laughs> they're like, we don't really get it, but <laughs> but you know now they buy our albums and they are like excited for us and they're you know proud of their son working in this prestigious university. I mean, I, I should, <laughs> but you know, I'll be real, part of it, like, I feel like I have to do something prestigious in the next, I'm, I'm due for a grant or something, otherwise my parents are going to be like, when are you going to get a real job, you know, still, and I'm almost 40, sorry, what you say? <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I, I'll hold the line a little bit, I, okay. I think they, they could have been a little more encouraging when it came to sort of music or the arts, you know, like, The idea that you would just end up totally destitute if, if you didn't, you know, immediately go to college or become a banker or something like that, yeah. some white collar job, you know, like our parents were middle class immigrants. Yeah. Right? They, they weren't, uh, they always felt the pressure of having to earn a living, right? But, but I, I think they had it a lot better than, than, than most folks that, you know, For sure. come to the country. So I think their amount of worry might have been a little bit kind of... Didn't, didn't, didn't necessarily wasn't warranted so. yeah well I mean we grew up in different homes too and I mean True. that is pretty you didn't go to college right away in our community that's like yeah. ooh yeah your kid had failed like it's good you had a couple you know it's like a, a no no in our I think community. I missed it so one point one first generation of course hmm. 1.5 or 1 uh, no I'm first generation first. he's 1.5 like he came over sorry sorry yeah 1.5 okay so yeah so that I, I should actually I don't know because I feel like first the first gens versus like the one point five versus the seconds, it's like there's always like a little balance of how the parents experience that first move and mm -hmm. what they feel. Sure, I don't know if that made a difference, but you know it's still like it all comes from the same place. You got to try harder and work harder and be be doctors and do whatever else. It's still there. Yeah. In the system. But well, he often jokes. He's like, "You American borns, you don't know." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, listen. But there's differentiation in the community too, right? Yeah. Like we had all these mean things, so like the kids that came over from India or from mm -hmm. Pakistan. We, like I remember my, I'm ashamed to say it, but I mean, we were embarrassed for them and like it didn't want to be associated with them, you know, because we were like, uh, you know, oh, yeah. we're American, you know, we were, especially where I grew up, it was very, there was a huge pressure to fit in. And if anyone got even a whiff that you were different or weren't um, performing whiteness, it was like, you just got kind of culturally beat down. And so I remember like my sister and I were the only Indian kids in our school of 3000 for years. And then all of a sudden um, something happened in the late nineties. I think there was a tech boom in South India and a lot of South Indian families started coming over with their kids that were eight, nine years old. And I remember immediately like in my mind, it was like, 
I don't want to be associated with these kids. I'm not like them. And, and you know, it, it brings me so much pain now to think that I, but that was the training that I had, you know, and that's, that's called racism. <laughs> that's, that's, that's internalized white supremacy is that, no, 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 I'm not like those other kids. So yeah, it was really kind of, and, and that happens now even. I mean, we live in a very, in a different world, but in some ways we don't. I think it's like, that's part of why I'm really glad that as a South Asian community, we're actually starting to to be a little bit more like notice I used to say Indian community that in itself is like very it's it's giving priority to people from India but South Asia is enormous and there's not everybody is like an upper middle class academic Indian immigrant you know there are people who are Bangladeshi and who are working class there are people who are Pakistani and have their identity also is complicated because there's their family might be Muslim and so they're dealing with anti Islam their like Islamophobia which is something my family never dealt with you know so so what's really cool is that the whole narrative, just like there's more and more tattooed punk brown kids, there's also like more recognition of, of the many, many, the very, very diverse community, you know, and what it means to be South Asian is like, there's not one thing, you know, it's not, I mean, no disrespect to Jhumpa Lahiri, but, you know, she was like one of the first highly visible, you know, authors of South Asian descent, and that narrative became like this way to see all brown people, but I don't think that's, it's not fair, you know, it does, it, it, it's, there's some erasure that happens too. And we've, as, as a South Asian community in Boston, have been trying to, trying to be more really, really intentional about making sure we're not excluding people and, and to welcome voices that, like people who never felt necessarily like South Asian American applied to them. Like we have brothers and sisters in Guyana who grew up as, you know, Guyanese. We have people from the West Indies, you know, people whose families are linked to the slave trade, you know. So, so these are all like important discussions and, and parts of, you know, our, the American experience that I think are just beginning to get the spotlight that they deserve. Yeah. How do you feel uh, the, the community here versus there? Like versus Boston. Yeah. Oh, we don't even. I, I feel like we haven't gotten deep in, deep, deep enough into it to know. Do you agree? I agree. I mean, there's there's a lot of people of South Asian descent here, and you know they are. I don't know there's a lot of people moving here. Um, I don't think we've met anybody yet from the uh, sort of. I, I would say art community. I mean, what, what's the community? Where are we right now? Tempe. 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 Yeah. Not like Chandler or any of the other ones. Like, where? Yes. Well, actually, I've gotten to meet one activist who's also South Asian American, Raji Ganeshan, an incredible South Indian dancer, educator, activist, performer. Um, and she's rad. She's like, I'm like you. I feel like we, like we see, I think our perspective is really similar, you know, um, that it's important to meet other South Asian people who are like, yes, we're all South Asian, and that's, Definitely, we share some things, but let's take our experiences and our pain, but also our privilege, and look outward. You know, and how can we al- make an alliance with other people who whose experiences to which we can be compassionate and to be relevant too? Because yes, we're South Asian, but we're also here. We're near the border. You know, we, we're learning a lot what it means to be, up, to be on native land. You know, and we were on native land in Massachusetts, but it never occurred to me really to do a land acknowledgement. But here, when you're in the middle of you know, all these native nations, it's just, it's like mind blowing to be here, you know, and, and what community means here, it probably is going to mean something so different, you know. What's the, uh, let's see, the... so we're not anywhere, there's no Phoenix connected to this, right, because right now we're just like in our own like little thing, I keep, I keep wanting to say like, we actually, when we set this thing up, we're like, oh, we're looking for Phoenix artists, uh-huh. we're looking for Phoenix things, almost everyone that we found so far either in Tucson uh-huh. or Tempe, no kidding. and it's, yeah, it's really weird, and even like the Chinese groups that my dad knows that he's going to set me up with, is like, Tempe, they're like a Tempe group, you know? <laughs> so, okay, it's, it's, it's weirdly... It's a small, it's a small place. It's a small area, and mm-hmm. the population obviously you guess out and really got to see the whole, the widespread um, part of this area. In in Austin, did you guys were you like in a certain area that you like felt like that was your community, or was it more like? Oh no, it was definitely centered around a brick and mortar space in a very specific part of Cambridge called Central Square. And I think that's probably because a lot of urban South Asians, because there's tons of South Asians, right? But they're out in the suburbs, most of them. 
And, but the ones who were in the, in the city or the Boston area weren't, that we knew, there was the artist and activist community was really centered in Cambridge. And part of that was because of that open mic community and because of small um, intellectual communities, like something called the Wednesday Night Discussion Group, which is this group of like South Asian people that would make a vegan meal and sit and talk about politics, history, art in South Asia every Wednesday night for 20 years. They're still doing it. Um, so it was an outgrowth of a physical space there. And actually here too, I think, I, I wonder how, it, what is the structure? Do people come, what do they coalesce around? I think this is some of the, like, is it a, a place? Is it the university that brings a lot of people from around the world? Um, so I was going to say, part of the Cambridge thing, Cambridge Mass thing, oh, it's was Harvard. that right. we, were, we were sort of, Central Square was between Harvard, Harvard and, and, Central, and, uh, and MIT, right? So you, you, const, you constantly had this pool of, of people that were coming there for a couple of years yeah, you know, to, to work on something usually academic and mm -hmm. I don't know, we're, we're always looking for a community or and, and of those folks I think there were you know some there were different degrees of wokeness and you know they kind of uh, gravitated toward sometimes I'm like do we need to like I mean we can barely speak our mother tongues <laughs> but I, I, I feel like language is something that gets quickly lost in the US with through generations like almost instantly right two or three generations forget it but uh, people remember music, they remember lyrics, they remember songs, you know, like you can probably, people probably can still sing little nursery rhymes in like French and stuff that they learn. And I think, I really do think it's because our brains interpret, our, the neural connections in our brains around music are so different. And I think it's different with language. So I, I have like this dream of someday having like a, like a kid's, it's like some kind of program for kids to just like, Maybe they won't ever be able to speak and write in their like grandparents' language, but at least they can feel it and like use their bodies to speak those words, even if it's in a nursery rhyme or a silly song or something. Because there's just something really powerful about connecting with your ancestors through sound, you know. Well, what you said earlier about being literally a kid and your family's got music going on the whole time, and you're oh, learning yeah. traditional music, and then you're also like an influence. Like that is part of it. Like mm -hmm. I remember as a kid having to learn Chinese songs. Uh, not really, yeah. not really caring about it at the time. Right. Now, like, like, oh, maybe that's part of why I like music. Yeah, even just a little bit. Like, I wonder, you know, I appreciate it a little more because of that. Yeah, it'd be nice to just have a community where that's always available. Like, because not everybody's parents like can do it or or have the time or you know, like what a what a service to do for a group of people like to to just like. Not teach them about the great and victorious nation, because you know what? Fuck nation states. You know what I'm saying? Like, fuck that. Fuck yeah. flags. Fuck borders. It's about like connecting with your ancestors. You know, and there's so many beautiful ways to do that that don't involve poli like the political constructs of countries, but that are more about like really just like being human together in the in the oldest ways possible. You know, <laughs> I'm like getting really emotional about it. I remember actually this was one of the things when I, was, I, I read the article, there was an article that came out about your band and you were playing some event, but then it was like very like talking about your politics, like you know how outspoken you were. I was like, yeah. oh, we got to feature this band. Because that was the other thing. It's like, it's not just, I'm going to go meet up with like Chinese, old Chinese musicians that are just like playing like out of tune arhus and like, <laughs> you know, for like an American celebration or whatever thing. And that's one thing. Yeah. But like to actually have a voice, mm. to have an ensemble that also has a voice. It's not just serving, servicing. Um, so even though you're saying like maybe not the, for the kids, maybe not like don't talk about nation politics, <laughs> right, or, you know, but like there's patriotism the that's like not necessary for a lot of the music. Yeah. But at the same time, to actually create a non like an ensemble a yeah. band that has a voice. Yeah, oh. I mean that's something that's inspiring for a lot of people. I think. I'm. I'm. I hope so. I'm so glad to hear that. That's like why we do it. Sometimes I'm like, is this? Are people? Are we getting through to people? <laughs> you know. And, was there ever a doubt though? Like, I mean, I guess when you started out, it was like Bollywood covers, but now, yeah. like, no, no, no. But like, whenever you started writing a song, or whenever you were out speaking about things, you know, I think I'm. I, I think to be a creative person is to be constantly riddled with self doubt. So I'm still to this day. I'm just like, I'm always wondering how people are reading us. You know, it depends on who they are, but. But I'm grateful to hear that. Actually, this thank you for telling us that because I, I don't know. I wonder how we'll be read. I wonder if sometimes I do. I'm like, I'll, I mean, I'll be very candid. I'm like, oh God, I love rock and roll so much. But is, does it matter? Does anyone listen to our music? Is anyone like buying rock songs? You know, it's not. 
it's not cool, you know, in this, it's not, um, it, the cultural cachet isn't there. But I also like the, my, I think I have an understanding that it's not always about like what instrument you play, you know, like I know it's also about what you say. And the, I hope in the future that like people will, will not look at like, um, will under, and certainly they will. They're, they're not going to be thinking as much about like the genre of music that we chose to express ourselves, but more what we were saying, you know. Um, and I honestly, I feel like that in about 20 years, rock and roll is going to come back full circle. It's going to come back, people. <laughs> um, because... <laughs> you know, get to do one of those 20th anniversary tours. One of those tours, yeah. <laughs> and just like tour the country and make so much money. Yeah. There's, a lot of, there's a lot of bands that started in 2007. I don't. I mean, I don't know if you have any friends that have bands. That oh yeah, I know a bunch of bands, and um, yeah, and totally. We, I'm pretty sure in about eight years, seven years. Uh huh. Yeah. Nostalgia tours. Like, I work. I'm gonna be a part of at least one. <laughs> I'm gonna be a part of one because this is like yeah. It's that cycle thing. It is. Yeah, it's totally. like high school reunion, except you're in a band. That's exactly what it is. And they're brilliant because somebody on their team is like, listen, these people are in their 40s now. They have 2.5 kids and they have money to burn. So they will totally go see, you know, insert, like, I mean, I'm like, who are all these people lining up to see the Goo Goo Dolls? And I was like, oh, my peers. That's who it is. <laughs> I'm also guesstimating is that they have kids. Yeah. And then, like, kids 18. <laughs> so two years later, they're like, oh, we can get back on the road again. The kids are all... I, time doesn't always work out that way, but I'm pretty it's sure. Like, or they're out of money. That's the <laughs> I see kids at the... I work in high school now, and I see kids with a Nirvana with Nirvana shirts on and stuff. I'm like, do you guys even know? <laughs> like, I, I hear myself sometimes, and I'm like, oh, my God. I'm that, like, old punk auntie who's like, do you know what Nirvana did? For fun, and they're Name like, three what? of their songs right now. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, I just got this at Forever 21. Or something. And I'm just like, of course. Can I ask, do you ever have higher expectations for kids that look like you who may or may not be getting into music, but they might either want to get into music or mm-hmm. you're like, you should get into music. Do you ever feel that? <laughs> so am I like a stage auntie? Yes. Um, yes. But, but totally. in the opposite direction. You know what? All joking aside, I do, I have to work really hard to not project my energy and my passion for music and especially rock music. Cause again, you know, I've been involved with girls rock camp and every uh, child in my life who's a girl or identifies as a girl, I've been like, have you thought about girls rock camp? There's many in your area. I think you could do it. I see a drum. I think you're a drummer. I bought my, my niece who's now th- um, seven. When she was born, I brought her a tiny. I bought her a tiny drum kit, and I mailed it <laughs> to her house. And of course, her parents, my sister and her husband, are like, "Thanks, dude. Thanks. Uh, she's gonna play drums all night now." You know. But yes, I I feel like very passionate about it, and sometimes I worry, or I, I want to be careful about um, pushing people to do what exactly what I did. You know, because <laughs> that's just something that we're like, my life has been great. Let me show my gratitude. You know. Um, but what I'm, what I'm appreciating more and more as I meet more and work more with young people is like, they all have their own way of doing it. So if you can just like transmit the excitement about expressing yourself and not actually caring what other people think, even if you really deeply care, but like still doing stuff, you know what I mean? Pushing past that, being a little brave or whatever. If you can translate something like that to them or forget it. I mean, just be yourself, you know? And, and be kind to other people. Like, I feel like that's, be yourself very unapologetically, you know? I think that's kind of what I'm going after, you know? And even, like, my two-year-old, two- or three-year-old nephew is, like, he calls me Mash Mash, which means auntie. He's like, Mash Mash, you look funny. And I'm like, thanks, man. I do look kind of funny, you know? And I, I, I appreciate that, you know? But, you know, little kids are always watching you. They're watching not just what you do and what you say, but they're watching how you react, and they're watching how you respond, and they're internalizing that, you know? <laughs> it's just like human behavior. <laughs> and so I try to be really mindful about that, especially uh, as, a not, as someone who's not a parent myself, but I don't know. It's, it's really kind of a joy to watch the kids in our lives grow up from the sidelines a little bit, you know? <laughs> what do you think? I'm oh, sorry, take a problem. I, I think you mostly nailed it. Um... They don't have to play rock music or any music. Some some kind of expression or self expression or interest in art was is awesome. Yeah. You know, especially in a world that kind of seems to discourage it or crush it. Uh, so, I, I think also a little bit of encouragement is definitely good. I mean, we could have used it. I think when we were younger. So, 
Yeah. So I, I think, uh, to answer your question, I, I don't know if I feel like I have higher expectations, but I, I feel like we should encourage them to kind of consider that as something that they can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, we often joke, like, what if the kids in our lives suddenly become huge sports fans? Because we don't, we, we don't, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> we're not really big sports fans. And I'm like, what do we do with those? You know, we don't know. But what, I think it's like the, there's things that kids will get no matter what just growing up in this country, right? Like, they're going to speak English. They're going to be fine. They're going to be indoctrinated into just sports culture, you know. But the, what are the things that people are telling that they can't be, you know? What are the things that, are, that nobody's talking about? You know, we have a lot of kids that are mixed race in our family. Who's, how can we make sure they feel like their experience is valid? And normalized, and 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 kids whose gender identity is there's not even a name for it yet. How can we make sure that our families are raising them and respecting them, honoring their path, you know, too? So I feel like definitely we have expectations in that way, you know, that like we want them to feel good about themselves, you know, even if we are just the auntie and uncle who are all like, "Be yourself, kid. You're gonna be fine," because they're gonna look. We, I mean, they're gonna look back and be like, "Hey." Thanks for my weird aunt. She did look funny, but... <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like we've gone from like being the weird cousins to being the weird, the weird aunt. aunt and uncle. <laughs> <laughs> it's but it's like really like rewarding in some ways when, you know, they come to visit and, and you know, my nephew like wants to go out on the motorcycle or whatever, you know? It's like, yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a <laughs> parents' nightmare. Yeah. Do not put my kid on that bike. Yeah. <laughs> we're that, we're that auntie and uncle, yeah. There are so many kids out there that played music back in the day that were like us, but mm-hmm. never like recorded it. And yeah. parents that's done it, and they're like, "Oh, oh, his dad played music." We're like, "What? You <laughs> play music?" But they would they would never admit it because that's not something that they would ever document. Right. So, for you, do you feel like you've done a pretty good job documenting your own works in the last? I guess you know, starting a little later, you also mm-hmm. had access to more material. But like even your early band, like, do you have any recordings or anything from them? There's there's a handful of handful of tapes, yeah. Do you do you have you digitized those or do you do you keep them close? The guitarist is supposedly working on them. He's he's got them. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Do you feel so, like that's an important thing to have? Like, oh yeah, you know? absolutely. Like, I feel like uh, you know I kind of come from a time when you couldn't always find something, or you couldn't find it twice. Um, a lot of like recordings or, or photos and stuff were kind of precious in that way, you know. Now, like you can you can take a picture with with almost anything or record almost anything anytime. Um, but you know, you just look look back at all those collections of like, you know, old pictures of like punk rock shows or whatever, and, and uh, I don't know it, it it makes it real. It kind of kind of gives gives stuff kind of like a mythic status sometimes too. It's I think documentation is very important. So, I mean, we taped a lot of stuff. Like, I, I, I taped a lot of those for his show, a bunch of other synths. We, uh, we, we, when we played in L.A., those shows in L.A., yeah. we taped every minute of, like, our road trip and stuff. You yeah. Know, yeah, and, you know, you recorded, you know, your own EPs and, mm-hmm. you know, lots of recorded a couple. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I think getting, getting that stuff uh, out there and recorded and documented is super important, for sure. You think for like kids? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, please continue. I was just thinking more like for like literally for the next generation too, like outside of just for your own memories. It's like seeing that it helps, you know, also validate what it was, mm-hmm. and also to see the growth, growth, just change over time. That first thing you recorded may may be terrible to you, or maybe it sounds great, but literally it's like. I want to hear somebody else's terrible first recording. Yes. Oh, oh my God. It's so true. It's for, it's for posterity. You know, it's, I, I think it, it's so much, it's easier now than ever, right? As you said, to record. And since day one, I have realized that we, no matter what, we have to document this. And it's not because, I feel like with our parents' generation, this, this flies in the face of our values of keep your head down and be humble, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, no, put your face on film forever and talk about every aspect of your life. You know, it's so, so why would one do that? You know, it's, I mean, I always joke, I'm like, I'm a huge narcissist, but actually I'm c- crushed with self-doubt. You know, I'm, I'm paralyzed by it sometimes. But, but you know what, in, in understanding the history of music or any art, but especially you and I with rock music, mm-hmm. 
we're, we're we both go to every screening about Afropunk bands, or we go to screen. You know, I'm involved, being involved in the feminist punk movement. What are we doing? We're looking back and digging up archives about Sister Rosetta Tharp, about the black women who literally invented rock and roll, and and that's why to me it's important is that you know what you know we're gonna get erased if we don't take a moment to like. You know, and it's not just about us. It's about making sure that the, the dominant narratives don't just simply, the default settings don't just take over, you know, that people realize that, you know, the history of, in our case, like rock music has always been diverse. It's never been white music. It's always been black music. And we owe it to, to future generations and to the ancestors of our, of our art form to acknowledge its roots, you know. I, I don't, I don't mean to sound like too obtuse, but really it's important because I think part, a big part of, of working against systems like racism is really is bringing the past to light, you know, and, and to record yourself is an empowering act. To write yourself into history is an empowering act, you know, and we have access to those tools. And even if all we accomplish is getting someone else to have that light bulb go off, like, huh. I should maybe record this. <laughs> then it's success, you know. I don't know. They, they always say that thing about um, Velvet Underground, you know, mm. only ever sold like a couple thousand albums, but they, they launched 10,000 bands or something, you know. Like the, and so it's not that I think what we're doing is the end-all, be-all, or that we're even the pioneers, because I'm sure we're not, you know, maybe of our specific kind of music. But it's just that, you know, you really, people don't realize how important that when they're the only ones doing it, if they feel scared, they're probably doing something kind of groundbreaking. <laughs> so they should record it for sure. Yeah. And I honestly, I, I wonder if in the, in the world that's post-digital, if the web crashes one day and we have a fight called kind of situation, whose history is going to be told, you know? You know, one thing that I, I wanted to say, talk, thinking about artists who move across time, like I think sometimes artists who who are the most brilliant, and by brilliant I mean who literally shine and emit light, right, are those who time travel. Like when they look into a camera, they know they're talking to the future generations, right? Like you see that with um, Sun Ra, you know, mm -hmm. and the parliament, right? And they, because they knew that they were rewriting history, that they were imagining alternative futures. And I think that right now, like, Afrofuturism has always been an inspiration of both of us. And part of that is because the power of talking about history by re rewriting the future. So anyway, artists who I think, and, and Wu-Tang too, they like knew that what they were doing was, was storytelling in, a, in an imaginative way, you yeah. know? And so I, I long to be like those artists who not just say like everything that's wrong with the, the status quo in the past, because that's important, but it's also about like, what are we gonna do about it? How do we want to be seen? How do we want to see ourselves, you know? And so I think there's some element about like really being able to 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 speak to people whose realities you don't even understand yet, you know. What I mean? So that's why I think documentation is important because <laughs> yes. you don't even know what's gonna happen, you know. This is stage one, honestly. Like I'm gonna be back in Phoenix probably or Tempe like next year yeah. meet some other artists. And the, the whole point is that we want to like follow up. We want to sure. keep, keep sort of any anything coming up, new projects. Um, like if your bands fully operational and as is, mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, cool, that's, that's as is, we'll check back in another year or something. <laughs> but like, you know, what's gonna happen in this coming year? Like, what's, what's the band's status right now and where it's going? Oh, that's a good question. We're, it's difficult because we're in different places. So I think we're having to innovate and take advantage of opportunities that present themselves. So to me, what that's, what that's looked like in the last couple of years is playing one or two major, major shows, um, especially if they're able to fund us to fly somewhere <laughs> and to have all six of us together. Um, but for me, what I hope that we turn more toward is really um, stepping into an educational role, you know, and working more with youth because this is, again, about the future. You know, like these kids that, you know, I really want to find more of a way to to connect with young people. And actually in March, we have a, the first opportunity of its kind, which came out of a more traditional gig at Newport this year. Um, there was a, the director of this school, school district's music program saw us at Newport. And he was sending us such good vibes from the stage. I was like, this dude's gonna come talk to us. Look at him, he's elated, you know, he's excited. 
Um, and he wants us to come in March. He's invited us to come and speak to his whole district, like all the music students. And he said, do you want to do a workshop? Usually, you know, we've had artists come do a workshop during the day and then a public performance at night. I was like, this is like a dream to me. You know, I'd love to do that. And it's not that we're experts, but I think in, in anything, I don't think, I mean, we all have day jobs pretty much, but it would be so rad to share with those kids just like, just an introduction of like basic, the ways you can pull from different parts of your life and make that your expression, you know, or, I mean, we're, maybe we could teach them some basic things about beats or guitar and how it's a global instrument or whatever, you know, but really just being there, I think, and being able to like connect with young people they're never going to remember what workshop we give, but they'll be like, I saw that lady. She was wearing this crazy color. You know, it was really cool. So I think more, I hope that our band gets more opportunities to do more with youth and, and educational spaces. And because we grow too as musicians in that way, you know, I do. Kids are a tough crowd too. They'll be honest with you. You know, like they're not going to be like, great set. Um, <laughs> you guys were having a lot, a lot of fun up there. It was great set. Um, yeah, that's my hope for the band, and and that we can just keep making music together. Actually, uh, now that we're learning how to record and stuff, I think we want to continue writing. Setting up your own space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's kind of like a disastrous room. That's literally my obsession right now with just home recording because I oh yeah out of my friend's studio we built like a full studio. Wow. But now I'm like back into the world like I, you know what I really enjoyed recording my bedroom. Mm. I really did. I record with my Mac Garage Band. And like a two hundred dollar adapter and one microphone, but from it I've been able to write music for two different plays. Um, I'd love to move into film scoring kind of stuff. And actually, people have asked a while ago. We've worked together to to write music for a play for a theater company in Boston. This is the retractability. This is the, oh, that's the current project. This is with a while ago, We were working on um, with the Huntington Theater Company on a play called The, the Who and the Lord. What. Yeah. And so I would love to do that kind of work too, is like scoring stuff, because I honestly don't think we sound like anyone else. And so um, th these really, people who are savvy in the theater world have gotten hip to that, like, oh, like our, our play will have a unique, you know, sonic sensibility if we hired this band. So it would be really fun to get to ask to do more like theater or even film projects. Maybe being out west, we can connect. People in LA, listen, um, just give me a call. So, and then, yes, do, you, please. do you see a different version of what you want to do in the next few years? I mean, that's, that's, that's it. Uh, I, I think, keep recording, keep playing shows as well. Yeah. Does the community still feel like you guys, does, does it be, being that spread apart, do you feel like there's like lapses in, in how tight the, tight -knit the community is as a band? Oh, that's a good question. You mean the community within the band? Within the band and then also like connecting to, the, to that community. It's tough. I mean, you, you kind of, it's hard to miss people now, you know? Like, Instagram, you can kind of see, like, what your buddy had for breakfast, you know? It's, distance is, is kind of weird, but I don't know. I, I feel like we still talk and, and, and message each other as much as we, we ever did. We don't <laughs> have true. regular rehearsals anymore, but... It helps that we're all friends, too. Mm. <laughs> through, through making music together, I think we all got to be really good friends, you know? And we just care about each other. You know, our drummer's having a kid, you know, we're all like, yay, we hope you play music, little one. No pressure, but we hope you play, you know. 